But as we go back to the second part of what we're going to study from the perspective of the New Testament on not only the preservation of human life, but I want to speak this hour on preparing for eternal life. While human life is precious and the sanctity of human life is to be a priority for every born-again believer, in fact, for every nation, believer or not, God created life, he sustains life, and he is the only one who has the right to take life. And of course, as we will study further in Deuteronomy, God has sanctioned and ordained that the leaders in nations and civil governments, there are occasions where they are to take life. In warfare, there are times when God sanctions the taking of life, and it is not a violation of the very commandment that he gave there in Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus chapter 20. And we'll look at the principles involved. But you, we go back to Deuteronomy 19, and right at the beginning of the passage, there in verse 2, it says, you'll prepare two, three cities. Now, Brother Darren, and I need to correct this, he said, you, you confused me a little bit about the Transjordan because I, I reversed east and west in my mind. I was talking about Moses being on the western side, and he wasn't. He was on the eastern side, and they were going to go into the western side of the promised land and take over Canaan proper. And I was reversing those two. So I appreciate you paying attention, catching that, and reminding me. I need your help. Sometimes my mind is already on the next thing, and what should be understood and correct is sometimes I will get those mixed up. My wife sometimes says, you're talking about Moses building the ark. So Moses didn't build the ark. He built the, maybe the ark, or the ark of the Covenant, but that's not the one we're talking about. Anyway, as we go back and, and look at this, notice there verse 3. It says, you'll prepare the way. And I want, you to, I want you to look at that phrase. As we look at God's concern for human life, and as I mentioned, God's intention when he created Adam was that he live forever and that he fellowship with the Lord forever. He prepared, he planted him a garden where he would not have to work, he would not have to plant, he would not have to sweat over his preservation of his own life as long as God gave him that life. But because of sin, the curse of death was placed upon mankind and all of creation, and we face all the things that we face today because of it. In fact, we had just been witnessing the turning of the colors, and people say, oh, how beautiful it is when the colors turn. But if you stop and think, just in a few days, all those are going to be dead and brown and on the ground. And then you have this grayish, brown, dismal, dead look for four or five months. And then, of course, the picture of the resurrection in the spring, you know, when everything comes back to life and turns green again, and you go through that cycle, well... I believe if Adam hadn't sinned, we wouldn't see all that. Because there, the water's above and the water's beneath and all that, the canopy effect, it had been a perfect, comfortable condition all around the globe. But Adam did sin. And that sin, as we saw in the last hour, God made a provision of those six cities of refuge. Three on the eastern side, three on the western side of the, Can of the Jordan River. And... He said here, when he said, you must prepare thee a way. This is a phrase that is so vital for them in the preservation of human life. And as I go back to the Talmud, let me mention the, the, the specifics of those roads going to the cities of refuge. They were by law to keep those roads in good repair, in good conditions, so that nothing would be a stumbling block or an impediment to the one who has taken a life involuntarily, accidentally, that he has a clear path with no hesitation to get there. They were to be, it's 32 cubits wide, that's 48 feet wide. Now you think about 48 feet wide, that's, that's a pretty good road. That's, that's as wide as my house is. So you, you go 48 feet, that's, actually mine's 40, so it's wider than my house is. So it's a good path, and it was to be kept clean from any stumbling block, rocks, anything. Limbs were to be trimmed at a certain height where even a man on a camel could ride under it without hitting the limbs. 
They even had laws in different places about people that built along the road. Balconies could not come over to a certain point. You, you thought all that came along in modern day where these zoning laws came into play, but no, even back then, there was a concern that that way be clear. And also, there were to be signposts at every crossroads. There was to be a signpost that said, Milliketh, Milliketh. That's refuge, refuge. And that way, the one who is fleeing for the city of refuge to save his life, he does not have to stop and ask him, which way do I go? At no point was there to be doubt in which way he was to go to get to that city of refuge. Now, as I've pointed, those cities of refuge are a picture and type of the Lord Jesus. And, of course, when they go and they are actually... The witnesses are verified, and the man's statement is true. This was involuntary. He is not guilty of death. He was not to die. He was to stay in that city of refuge until the death of the high priest. And then when the high priest died, his death was, in a sense, a cleansing to where he could now go home free and clear. But if he left that city of refuge before the death of the high priest... The avenger of blood could come and kill him with no consequence because he should have remained inside that city. Numbers chapter 35 clears that up. So God made this provision. And these were pointing to another way. And as we turn up over to John chapter 1, I want us to just recap in a sense, take a moment, because we're talking about this in Deuteronomy, I want to just take this hour. And just remind ourselves that God has prepared a way. And in, in many ways, he, he made our refuge, as the Bible calls him over and over throughout the scriptures. He provided a refuge for you and I to go. But there's something different about our condition. In this case, man may or may not be guilty of murder. He may or may not you know, have, have his life spared if he is guilty of murder. But the facts are these, if he goes to that city of refuge and he remains there, he must stay there until the death of the high priest, then he can go home. There's a provision for human life, but I'm talking now about spiritual life. I'm talking about that which goes on for eternity. And folks, I want you to stop and think about this. Romans 5, as we read it a little while ago, it, it gives us a dismal picture, does it not? It says in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man, that is Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So it tells me here that all have sinned. If you go back to Romans 3, it paints an even more bleak picture. 3 verse 10 says, there, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That means there's not one among the seed of Adam that meets God's holy standard. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we see now that God condemns us all. We're condemned under the law. And then Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. That's the, the sentencing. So what is our sentence? Now that we are sinners and we are condemned as sinners, Romans 3.23, we fail to meet his standard, we come short. Well, the wages of sin is death. The right judgment, the right sentence for sinners is death. And it's not just physical death, it is eternal death in a place called the lake of fire. The Bible says it burns with fire in the brimstone. And that verse does not stop there, it says, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God has made a provision for us to prepare for eternal life. Yes, his intention was that man should live forever in perfect harmony and fellowship with the Lord without the effects of sin. Genesis 3 kind of took care of that, didn't it? As I pointed out before, the first two chapters... In the Bible, describe what it was before sin entered into the world. The last two chapters define what it will be like after, when sin is vanquished from the world. And all those chapters in between deal with God redeeming sinful man back to himself 
and into a relationship with him. Only four chapters in all the Bible define what it was like before and what it will be like once God gains the victory. And he, well, he already has the victory. It's just he will accomplish his plan for man's redemption at that point. But I want to look at a couple of things here this morning. Turn with me to Isaiah. And I'm going to remind you, I'm going to kind of bring a synopsis and application to what we've been talking about in the life of John the Baptist as the forerunner of Christ, the one who came and his message was, he was to prepare the way of the Lord. So in Isaiah chapter 40, where this was first prophesied, remember the Pharisees came down, sent from the leaders there at the temple, and said, go find out who this guy is out there baptizing Jews. There's no baptism of Jews. This isn't the church. This isn't a Gentile wanting to convert to Judaism. So what is he out there doing? So they came down and says, who are you? Are you, are you, and he, apparently they asked if he's the Messiah, and he said, no, I'm not the Christ. Are you Elijah? We're supposed to be watching for Elijah, because it says he will come before, no, I'm not Elijah. Are you that prophet referred to in Deuteronomy chapter 18, as we saw? No, I'm not that prophet. Well, just who are you? Well, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 and following tell us this, says, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. John the Baptist was that one who came to be that voice in the wilderness. And he came to prepare the way of the Lord. Now it refers back in that day to a literal physical preparation of a highway for the king to travel on it. They would go through and if there were low spots it would be uncomfortable for his caravan to go down in those dips. They would fill those in where it would be smooth. If there were hills that would be uncomfortable to go over they would bring those down and flatten those out. When John the Baptist came, remember you had the, the high priests and the deep corruption that was there in the high priesthood, what they were doing in the temple with the sacrifices and the money changers and all of this. Annas and Caiaphas had brought that office down to such a low point, it is a wonder God allowed them to live. The priesthood as a whole had gone after them. The Sadducees, the liberal group who denied the supernatural. The Pharisees, the legalistic group who added to the law of God. And then the people themselves. There were some things that had been crooked and perverted in, amongst this and rough spots. And John the Baptist came not to go physically straighten out the highway. But he was preparing for Israel's king, the Lord Jesus, to come. The one who would sit on the throne of David. But he was to prepare the hearts spiritually for the Lord's coming. And how did he do that? He says, you repent. He was baptizing them, the baptism of repentance unto the forgiveness of sins. You repent of your sins. Prepare your hearts. The king is coming. He is here. God had promised. So we see that the way was promised back in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. And we see that... He was, that way is often prevented. When it says there in Isaiah 40, 30, chapter 40, verse 3, it says, or verse 4, Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain made low, the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. I'm reminded that the path to eternal life is often obstructed. There are things that are in that path that hinder the lost coming to Christ. What are some of the impediments? What are some of the stumbling blocks or stones that are along that way to that city of refuge, which is Christ, as we look at it? Because we are all condemned as sinners. We all need refuge in Christ. We must all come to the saving knowledge of him and receive the gift of salvation. We know that Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved. Grace is an unmerited favor, a gift from God. And he goes on to say, Through faith, that's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. 
You can't acquire it on your own. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But so many have put valleys in that road to salvation. They put mountains in the road to salvation. They have put crooked ways and stones and stumbling blocks. What are some of those stumbling blocks? Well, there are those who say, Preacher, you don't know all that I've done. You don't know how grave the sins that I've committed and how dark my past is. I, I don't know that God would ever receive a sinner like me. Remember what the Apostle Paul said, one of the greatest preachers of the Word of God, one that he encountered the Lord Jesus himself on the road to Damascus, got saved, and God used him to turn the world upside down along with those other apostles. But he said, I am the chiefest of sinners. Now, when, I believe it was uh, Spurgeon spoke of a, the first Sunday after he got saved, said he went to a Methodist church. And the preacher was preaching on that statement. He said, now, when Paul made this statement, he was the chief of sinners. That's before he got saved. He was not yet saved. Oh, what an error. Paul did not write scripture until after he got saved. He was not describing it before. He said, as an apostle, as a saved man, I am the chiefest of sinners. But even before he got saved, the things, he was guilty of persecuting the church of Christ, of leading to the incarceration and death of many of the followers of Christ. God can save, as one man put it, from the guttermost to the uttermost. Aren't we thankful for that? Don't place that impediment there. Say, well, I don't know that God, it, it, again, you're focusing on you and what you've done. You've got to remember that it's what God and what he has done that saves us. It's not what we have done. Number two, well, you know, I just, I don't feel saved. Many who doubt their salvation come to the point this, I, 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 feel, I think I should have this feeling or this experience and well, I believe there will be an experience. I believe because the Bible says the Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. But if you're looking for some sensational experience, it's not necessarily going to be that way. We hear the Word of God. It is the truth is preached. We believe the Word of God. We receive the gift of God. And at that point in time, we are saved and the Spirit of God comes to indwell us. And we don't live on the basis of how we feel because I will assure you, no matter how dedicated you are as a Christian, there will be days you wake up and you don't really feel like a Christian. There will be days you will have responses and reactions and attitudes that you say, am, am I even saved? Now, there's no excuse for that. But the fact is, if we go based on feelings, then we will all be saved and lose our salvation all the time. And that's not what it's based on. Because it's based upon what God accomplished. And every term in scripture that refers to our salvation is a term of completed action. It's something that occurred at a certain point in time with abiding results that will not change. Aren't you glad for that? Do you know that almost, well, the vast majority of evangelical churches, those who claim to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, they will still take and teach you that you can lose your salvation. If you leave our church, or if you don't do this, or if you don't do that, then you will go to hell. Even after you trusted Christ. That's not biblical. It's not proper interpretation of the scriptures. It's not how sinful you are. It's not how you feel. And other times people say, you know, there are days I believe Christ can do this, and there are days that I believe he can't do this. Again, you're focusing on you and your authority and what you believe, and what you believe he can do is not what determines your salvation. It's not the strength or the reality of your faith that saves you. It is through faith, but it's the object of that faith. When I believe Jesus is who he says he is, even if I don't feel like it, even if things around me they're saying differently, but I hear this Jesus, if I believe he is who he says he is, and he did what he says he did, and that he will do what he said he will do, if he is the way, the truth, and the life, then if he says salvation is by faith and receiving that gift, then if I do that, then I am saved. I don't care what others believe. I don't care what others say. 
That is what the Word of God says, and I will rest my eternity on that. No matter how unbelievable or incredible it may seem, because the object of our faith is the Lord Jesus. Well, doubts. There are people who have doubts. You know, I, I know the Lord said he would save me, but then I went and did this. There's a young lady. She trusted Christ as Savior. And I mean, it, it was a pretty clear transformation. And a week later, she came back to church and I, I asked her, said, How, how's it going? And she said, she, she started crying. She said, Pastor, I'm not saved. I said, what's going on? She said, well, I sinned again. I did something that I did before. And I said, well, I said, you still have an old nature. And believers still sin. That's why we have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And she said, really? I said, yeah. It doesn't mean you're going to stop sinning. It just simply means that we should begin to sin less and the more we mature in Christ the more we know about the Lord the more we get into the scriptures the less we will practice sin fifthly there are those who think that well if I'm not producing fruit immediately in fact some will say I'm going to start producing fruits of a Christian. I'm going to start looking like one. I'm going to start behaving like one. I'm going to get rid of the sin in my life. And then I will trust Christ. You'll never do it. If that's the criteria, you think I've got to first straighten out my life and cleanse my life of all sin to then come to Christ. You will never come to Christ because we cannot do that alone. It requires the Spirit of God to do it. He receives us as we are, as sinners. And He redeems us, He cleanses us from sin, and He empowers us through His Spirit that will indwell us to live according to His will. That means those vices, those habits, those things in our lives that they enslave us prior to salvation. It doesn't mean it's not going to be a battle physically to get over it. But you now have the Spirit of God, and we should get over them through the power of the Holy Spirit and through our faith in God and our determination to serve and honor Him. But that prepared way that God promised, He prepared a way. He said, I'm going to send someone to prepare the way for the Messiah. And then we see that in so many ways it was a prevented way. Prevented by men themselves who refused to recognize the Lord. Prevented by those who refuse to acknowledge God's authority in their lives. We talked in the earlier hour about the sanctity of life and how we need to have the same view God has toward human life. And in a country where you deny creation that God made man and he breathed into him the breath of life, and you begin to teach in your schools and your children and your population and your scientists and now your leaders of the nation that we have evolved from animals. We were not made in the image of God. Okay, they taught you that in Sunday school. They teach you that. No, Genesis 1 and 2, you can get rid of. Well, if you can get rid of that, get rid of 3 too, because this thing of sin, that's just not. We don't want people being brought down by that. And then they go on to deny all the way up to chapter 11. And then all of a sudden, if we're not made in the image and likeness of God, and all these other things are, are the case, so it's not sin, it's a disease, or it's this, or it's that, then all of a sudden you can see why the sanctity of life would all of a sudden be seen as far less. That fetus rather than that life in the womb. What about the elderly? There's more and more talk these days about I call it the abortion of the elderly now. They're talking about, well, you know, there's so much sickness and this, and there, there are discussions out there about panels deciding the end of life. In fact, we had a group in a previous presidency a few years ago who was discussing this. Having a panel of medical doctors that made the decision of who gets treatment and who doesn't to preserve life. Oh, they've lived long enough. They've had this, so... Well, we'll just keep them comfortable. When we start viewing it as anything that, other than 
God gives life and God takes life. That changes the way. But the way is prevented by men who refuse to acknowledge God. Romans chapter 1, we won't go through that again, but it, descri it describes that downfall. It will change the genders, it will change the family, it will change our attitude towards every aspect of social life that God has given us. But the biggest thing is it will prevent man. It will be an impediment in man's eyes and mind of what he needs to do before the Lord. But I want you to look at God's proclaimed way this morning. We saw the importance of that prepared way in the Old Testament as it related to the manslayer, as he called, getting to a place of refuge when he was not worthy of death to preserve human life. But God is even more concerned than he is about human life with where we will spend eternity. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Jesus speaking to his disciples concerning heaven. He's preparing them for what's going to take place very soon after this. In fact, chapters 14, 15, and 16, he's preparing them for his departure, his death, his burial, resurrection, and return to heaven. Chapter 17, he prays for them there in the Garden of Gethsemane. But in chapter 14, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In other words, believe God is who he said he is. Believe God sent me as he said he would. And believe the message I'm giving you. In my Father's house there are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So here we see God preparing the promise of the preparation. He prepared the way through John the Baptist. The way came and he executed that way of salvation for eternal life. And now he's leaving and he's going to go back. He says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you that when you leave this life because of the curse of sin, I'm going to go prepare a place for you to dwell for all eternity with me. All of a sudden that word prepare is becoming a special word in scripture, isn't it? He says, I, I go to prepare a place for you, and, and I, if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Now, that's a promise. If I go, and he went, there were eyewitnesses. And he said, I will come again. And the angel came and said, this same Jesus that you saw caught up into the clouds, he will come in like manner. And one day he's going to step out on that cloud. He's going to call the church home. Seven years later, he will come in the clouds and Come down to the Mount of Olives and he will establish his kingdom. But for 2,000 years, he's been preparing a place for you and me. I like what John Whitcomb says about that. He says, if in six 24-hour days he made this marvelous creation that we have today that we still have not fully understood or learned about, imagine what he can do in 2,000 years. It will be a special place, a special time. And then he says this, that where I am, you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Again, the preparation of the way and knowing the way, this is a vital thing. And the cities of refuge, they were to be wide, they were to be well marked, cleared of any obstacles, and signage everywhere saying, refuge, this way. He says, you know the way. And then Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, God sent the preparer of the way, and then he sent the way. And by the way, do you know that in Jesus' day, the message that he preached and that his disciples preached, it became referred to as, they're the preachers of the way. You'll see some, some Bibles as listed as the titles, The Way. And it's drawing from that, even though I would not necessarily endorse the translation of it, but it's drawing from that concept. The apostles, after Jesus died, was buried, rose again, and returned to heaven, as the church began there in Acts chapter 2 and the apostles were preaching, they would be referred to in the book of Acts as the preachers of the way. What way? 
It's that way that was promised, that way that was prepared, that way that we often, so often, prevent by simply not believing God and taking Him at His word. But then we see here the way proclaimed. Jesus said it first, and then those who came after him, including you and I, we are to proclaim it until he takes us home to be with him, that he is the way. There is no other way, folks. Bible Baptist Church will not save you. The Baptist Church will not save you, or any other denomination. No cult, no man, no works, no efforts or righteousness that we can muster up will ever get us into heaven. He is the way. He is the truth. That means that anyone who tries to teach you any other way to heaven, they are proclaimers of what Paul calls something that is to be accursed, anathema, literally destroyed. He said, I don't care if an angel from heaven comes or if I come and teach you another way other than we have already preached, which is through Christ then let them be accursed. Let them be done away with. I am the truth. Today, man has become so arrogant as to think that he is enlightened and he knows better than God. And he'll read the scripture, well, you know, they once believed that, but today it's not that way anymore. We believe this. And he will elevate his thinking and his opinions above the revealed, stated word of God. Folks, Jesus is the truth. The word that he spoke and the word that he has preserved for us today in the scriptures, that is the truth. Anything that departs from this is not truth. Now, you will hear our government and scientists and experts talk about, well, we follow the science, and science is truth. No, it's not. S true science is, because it, it reflects what God has revealed, what God has done. But when it contradicts, they say science is truth and God is false. That's why we have this gender confusion out there today. This is why we have this origin of life confusion out there today. This is why we have the evolutionary confusion out there today. This is why we have the political and all these other chaos. All the chaos out there today. Because we don't believe God's truth. He is the truth. He has proclaimed that he's the way, he's the truth, and he is the life. He gave life. John chapter 1, the first, first verses of it, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He created all things, and all things were made by Him, and there was nothing made except that which He had made. So Jesus is the Creator. Colossians, He is the Sustainer. Hebrews and Second Peter, He is the end of all things. So that means when he says he is the life, there is not life in any other. In fact, Paul said that in Acts. There's no other name through which we will find salvation but the name of Jesus. He is the one who gives us everlasting life. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus is now preparing a place. He, he, the way was promised. The way was fulfilled. And even though many will prevent it, the way is being found by so many. The Bible speaks of two ways. One is a straight and narrow path, the way that leads to life, and it says, few there be that find it. But wide is the way and broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many there be that enter in thereat. There are two ways. God has prepared a way for you and I, if we will believe, if we will receive. And he is there preparing a place, as I mentioned. But let me ask you this question. There are many today that do not understand. Yes, they will focus on the preservation of this life, and that's a doomed effort because of the curse of sin. Barring the rapture, all of us will go by way of the grave. Now, it does not need to be a matter of panic or a matter of fear for a believer because the Bible says those who will receive salvation 
Jesus said, Jesus said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him. It didn't say works for their salvation, whoever earns their way, whoever is worthy. No, whosoever, and that means anyone who believes in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. That means they believe they are sinners. They believe that Christ died for their sin. And if they will receive him, he will forgive them and cleanse them of their sins. If they will simply trust in him. And then they will have everlasting life. We make provisions for this life. We will have health insurance. We will have life. In, we'll have all these different things to try to maintain and preserve as comfortable as possible in this life. But folks, as believers, our primary concern should not be for this life. It should be making sure we are prepared for the next life. Because our soul will live on in one of two places. The Bible speaks of heaven for the believer. You go to, Je to Revelation chapter 20, 21, 22. Well, 21, 22. It describes heaven. But there's another place that's been prepared The Bible refers to it as a place that's prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, you can imagine if the place prepared for the believers to spend with the Lord, it must be a marvelous, glorious place. But for the one who rebelled against God back in the beginning, and the one who led astray so many and has opposed and been the adversary of God throughout all of human history, and then it comes to a culmination there in the tribulation period. He's bound for a thousand years during the millennium and released for a short period. But then the Bible says he is cast into the lake of fire. That is the place where the devil, his angels, will join the beast and the false prophet. We see that there in Revelation chapter 20. But I would be remiss if I just left that at that because... There's a very grave truth about this, folks. While the Bible says that the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels, I'm afraid many, many more will join them there. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. Well, actually, I'm going to begin in verse 11. Revelation 20, verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, and whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books. That's the books of works, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So these were the ones who didn't want to receive Christ. They wanted to go by their works. They wanted to earn their way. Okay, you'll be judged then by your works. It says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. First death is physical death. Second death is eternal death. But look at verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But preacher, you said the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. Yes, it was. And God made a provision that no man had to go there. Had they repented of their sins and believed God and the provision he made of a way to salvation. Sadly, the vast majority will never go. They will never receive. They will never believe. They will add these. No, that's too easy. I must work. I must earn. I must do this. I must do that. Or I've sinned too much. It's always a focus on them. And then they do not believe and receive what God has done for them. God has been preparing a way for man from the beginning when he sinned until the end of his plan for humankind. And today he offers that salvation. He offers it to you and I. Now many of us, we are here saved today. We know the Lord. But let me ask you the question, what is our concern for those around us who don't? 
Yes, we support missionaries, but are we being a missionary where God has placed us? Are we proclaiming that way, the truth, and the life through Jesus Christ to those around us that God brings us in contact with that don't know this? We need to have not only the proper view of human life, but we have to have the proper perspective on eternal life. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as Savior. I don't know hearts. I can't tell you who's saved and who's not. But the Lord can. And the Spirit of God is convicting a heart this morning. We want you to know that God has prepared a way. Not just a way to a city of refuge to preserve human life, but he has prepared a way that you might know of a certainty this morning that if you die, you will enter into heaven for all eternity. And if you reject Christ, you will know of a certainty that when you die, you will go into the lake of fire for all eternity. No doubt, it's a certainty. So the question is, what will we do with that this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. And Lord, we thank you that you prepared these things for us. In spite of our sinfulness, in spite of our disobedience, Lord, you have made a provision for mankind that we don't deserve. That's why it's grace. You do not give us what we do deserve, which is death and hell, and that is your mercy. But Lord, there's a world out there today that is rejecting your mercy. They are rejecting your grace. And they are continuing on that path towards eternal perdition. Lord, I pray that we would have your mind and the mind of Christ and the heartbeat of the Lord towards missions beginning right here at our Jerusalem, Christiansburg. And then may our vision extend around the world to those who need to come to Christ. Apply your word now and do in our hearts what pleases you in Christ's name. Amen.